Hi, my name is Patricia Kathleen, and this podcast series will contain interviews I conduct with women, female-identified, and non-binary individuals regarding their professional stories and personal narrative as it relates to their perspective. This podcast is designed to hold a space for all individuals to learn from their counterparts, regardless of age, status, or industry. We intend to transparently investigate the evolving global dialogue regarding underrepresented figures in all industries across the USA and abroad. By hosting these stories and conversations, we aim to contribute to the changing platform and representation of these individuals for the future. Now let's start the conversation. Hi everyone and welcome back. I'm your host Patricia and today I am so excited to be sitting down with Lynn Power. Lynn is the CEO of Masami, which is a botanical hair product company. You can find out more about her and the company at www.lovemasami.com. That is L-O-V-E-M-A-S-A-M-I.com. Welcome Lynn. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to kind of climb through your personal background as well as uh, mess on me, the company. I actually really like a lot of the direction that it's headed and it has a lot of very similar constituents to the work that we do at Patricia Kathleen Podcast in regards to um, responsibility towards the earth and um, everything that it's doing. For everyone listening, I will read a brief bio on Lynn before I start peppering her with questions. But prior Mm -hmm. to that, a quick roadmap for today's podcast. For those of you that are new, it's following the same trajectory, the four core constituents that all of them in the podcast series, this one, do cover. So we will first look at Lynn's academic background and early professional life. Then we'll turn towards um, unpacking Masami. Uh, We'll get into logistics about who, what, when, where, why, how, founders, how long it's been around, all of those things, what it is, the products. And then we'll turn to the ethos and some of the philosophy that this particular company actually um, enumerates on quite beautifully and has a lot to say about that. Our third point will reach into Lynn's goals and plans for the next one to three years, um, both with Mas and me and maybe personally and how those two kind of intertwine. We'll wrap everything up with advice that she has um, regarding uh, her success, her legacy, what she's done with her professional life and her current work. But um, prior to that, as promised, a quick bio on Lynn. Lynn is a longtime ad agency executive with a love for beauty. She's been fortunate enough to work on many iconic brands, including the Gillette Venus Global Marketing Launch, Clinique Global, L'Oreal Natural Match Launch, and um, Vive Relaunch, Nexus Repositioning, uh, Vichy Positioning, and La Roque. Laroc Posse, I'm probably not saying a lot of these right, I'll let Lynn correct me in a second, and St. Ives. She has done lots of other categories too, including American Express, Hershey's, Campari, Kimberly Clark, Nestle, uh, T. Rowe Price. She loves building teams and reinventing cultures and disruption, which I love that. Um, You can contact her at her current position. Um, find more about the website again at www.lovemasami.com. So Lynn, um, I, you've had an amazing career. You've worked with, there's not a person alive that hasn't heard of one of these brands and, and the ad agency, one can only um, imagine the kind of wealth that you've developed. And I'm hoping that you can, um, prior to unpacking Masami, I'm hoping you can kind of walk us through an understanding or a summary of your academic background and professional life prior to going to Masami. Yeah, sure. So um, unlike my uh, children today who are 19 and 17 and are kind of now having to figure out what they're wanting to do and figure out their majors very early, um, Mm -hmm. I had no idea. (laughs) Um, And I actually was a double major of criminal justice and English. And I was thinking for a hot minute that I was going to go into law school, but then I was like, Ooh, that's just boring. I I can't do that. (laughs) Um, So then I decided I wanted to um, go into the FBI and I went through the whole application process and it was 1989 and there was a hiring freeze. It was a recession. And I got kind of a form letter back saying, um, Thanks, but no thanks. You know, you've kind of you've made the you've made the list su- supposedly, but we're not hiring. So check back in in six months, kind of thing. I was living at home at my parents' house, so I was like, that's just not going to work. <laughs> 
So I met a recruiter who sent me on an interview for advertising. Um, and she said, this is what you're going to do. And I was like, oh, I hadn't really thought about it. It was interesting, but I didn't go to school for it at all. I've never taken an advertising or marketing class. And she sent me on an interview and I was a really good typist. And so um, they hired me as a receptionist. And um, from there, I just loved the culture, the creativity, and I kind of was able to just work my way up and, you know, I, it, it just stuck. I just really enjoyed it. So, you know, I went from a small agency in Chicago to a bigger agency in Chicago. And then I met my, my boyfriend, now husband at the time, and we moved to New York. And then, you know, I, I was able to at least uh, stretch, stretch my wings at um, the New York shops and um, worked at several of the, of the large ones, um, all the way up until my last job at J. Walter Thompson. I was the CEO of the New York office. Wow. Amazing. It does. So it does for everyone listening, you know, I have like this very Hollywood version of the advertising agency. I must say like my internal knowledge is probably limited to what I've seen on like Mad Men or something. But um, I'm wondering, is it, is, does, is New York really the, like kind of the nexus of advertising? It's kind of perceived, you know, I think amongst a lot of lay people as like this heart, this heartthrob heart center of the advertising world. Would you concur with that? Yeah, I absolutely would. And I think if you're really serious about the business, you just can't beat the experience you get at a, at a, at a New York agency. So um, you don't have to do it forever. I thought I was going to do it for two years, maybe. And then I, I ended up being in New York for 25 years. So <laughs> <laughs> New York kind of just grabs you and doesn't let go, you know, and you just have to go with it. It's amazing. The time period that you were in as well. I mean, and it's probably, it's probably my age. I'm 43, but you know, that time period in advertising, it, it went through um, almost a diabolical, like up and down. I feel like the eighties, the nineties, um, the nineties in particular, you know, it was a, a disconnect, a reconnect. It, it's particularly because the society itself was like having these schizophrenic breaks with health and things like that, that were so pushed, you know, in, in the advertising industry, but like, fat-free, sugar-free, additives, this, that, that, preservatives, like all of these different things that were kind of chronicled and a lot of different caveats in society. But I imagine it would have been a really wild ride to be involved in um, during that time period. Would you, do you think, do you feel that way now? Or looking back, do you think, nah, the advent of social media really shook things up? It was the aughts that really changed things. Um, no, it was definitely um, an interesting industry to be in for sure. Um, it's changed massively. I mean, there's so many things that have changed about it since I started, um, you know, primarily the, the, the way that the industry uh, was, was monetized was through people and hours and clients just don't pay the kind of fees anymore. So you don't have the ability to put the people in the hours and all that stuff. Um, so there's a lot of, there's, there's a huge sort of seismic shift happening and things being much more accountable, things being more mm -hmm. obviously digital um, and um, more analytical, you know, so creativity has become more analytical. But I was definitely very much in, still felt like the Mad Men era looking back where I didn't, you know, I grew up with two brothers. I'm very comfortable around men. So I, I wasn't sort of um, as overtly aware at the time of, of the, sort of sexism. I mean, I knew it was there, but um, uh, looking back, of course, I go, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. You know, because today you wouldn't, you wouldn't allow those, some of those things to happen. But, um, you know, at the time when you're in it and you're kind of looking around and there aren't many other women, you just sort of try to do what you can do to, to you know, prove yourself. Um, and I'm lucky that I never had any sexual assault or any, you know, any, anything other than, you know, sort of, um, verbal, <laughs> verbal dressing down kind of things happened yeah. to me. I'm wondering as a, f a female who climbed through the ranks, um, did you know of any others? Were you friends with other women or women identified or non-binary individuals that were also hitting like this successful stride of, of climbing that corporate ladder or were you all alone? Um, it was, it changed throughout the years. Um, you know, there was a time when I was at one of the agencies I worked at and I was pretty much 
the top woman there. And um, I will say, unfortunately, a lot of the female bosses I had in my early years were really bad bosses. Hmm. It's almost like they felt they had to operate like men yeah. and be these tyrants. Um, and it actually helped form my leadership style because I didn't want to be like that. I was like, wow, if that's how you think you have to behave to get people in line, that is not good. So, you know, it's almost like when you're raising kids and they do the opposite of what you tell them. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. um, I had a lot of role models that were really bad, actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of decided when I got to a senior enough point that I don't want to emulate um, this very um, gruff, rough, male swagger arrogance you know that's yeah. not at all who i am and if people don't like it and i don't get promoted anymore well then fine that's just the way it is but um i think i was lucky that um i think the female leadership traits are more effective ultimately listening being more transparent, you know, having vulnerability. I think those are things that people actually appreciate. Um, so, you know, I think um, any women listening out there, you know, those are things you should embrace. You should not shy away from. Yeah, particularly for your industry. It's always shocking to me when someone says, you know, the, the, the creative or more discussion oriented or idea sharing personality doesn't survive in creative endeavors like advertising. I mean, I, I can it to a doctor, you know, who chain smokes and drinks like a fish. It's just mm -hmm. like what those, the, the, her expertise isn't being lived out, you know, and I, I wonder when, as you climb up through the ranks, you yourself be turned to hiring and things of that nature, what kind of personalities um, were you kind of bringing on to work with you and under you to kind of facilitate what you're describing here, which is just a more, um, what sounds to me like a more communicative environment? I mean, I was always overtly hiring women and diverse people. Um, I would demand my HR teams find those candidates, even though mm. it's harder to find. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I wouldn't always hire them, but, but I made a point of, you know, really trying to lean in heavily and bring in women and bring in people of color. And I hired a guy in a wheelchair. People said to me, you're crazy. He's not going to be able to travel. You know, what are we, he was great. <laughs> there were no issue, you know? Um, but I think, um, I think you just have to kind of demand that. And then in terms of the traits of the people, I always look for people that are curious you know, that, that um, are not close-minded, people that want to learn, um, people that are not afraid to, you know, learn from above, but also learn from the people under them in the sense of like, I get a lot of learning these days from my children <laughs> mm -hmm. and from younger people that I, that I work with. Um, and it's really a two-way street. So as much as, you know, sometimes they look to me for my experience, I look to them for their know-how when it comes to TikTok or you know, yeah. so many other things that I don't understand, right? So I think it really is about that vulnerability of admitting what you don't know, being open and willing and curious. Um, and I think those traits will get you pretty far. Yeah, and cognitive functioning, you know, and studies done in geriatric communities would back you up on that one. You know, staying curious, which are people you hired and then you're doing yourself, you know, is linked to longevity of the mind, of the vital mind and cognition. So I think that those span all throughout life, not just the advertising industry. I think that's fantastic. I'm wondering um, with the... I like what you said, and I'm hoping to just get you to enumerate a little bit on it because it you just reversed the power structure that I think most people feel like HR and hiring has. You said, I would make my HR team go out and find those people. And um, I think that there's a lot of conversation, particularly in female, female identified and non-binary communities where people say like, well, I want to hire, you know, a woman led company, but I can't find any, like, I, I don't know. And it's, it it's becomes this crutch, you know, not just for these communities, but for people outside of those communities to not say, I don't, they're not represented. You know, I'm yeah. most familiar with, um, female, female identified, non-binary uh, computer engineers. 
people saying, I want to hire more female tech nerds, but I, they're not out there. They're not, you know, and you switching that dialogue and taking that power and saying, no, 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 you go find them to HR is such a novel idea. I've never heard anyone describe it that way. What, um, what kind of incited you to do that? Were you just determined to have it and you made them go out and find it? Because I can, HR is very good at saying, here you go. This is all we got, you know, in any industry. What I figured out is like shit in, shit out, right? So, you know, if you give them a shitty brief, they're going to give you a shitty candidate. Well, not, I'm not saying they'll give you a shitty candidate, but they'll give you what you ask for. Yeah. And usually it's the same old, same old. And um, what I believe in, and, and I'm actually quite good at it, it's one of my superpowers is building teams. Um, and I'm really good at identifying talent. And thank, thankfully, so I don't have to do everything. I can bring in people that are great. And um, I've always hired on potential, not on proven uh, capability, meaning you just have to widen the net a little bit, you know, because if you only hire people for the Campari account that have worked in liquor, um, and oh, I need somebody who actually has worked in brown spirits, you know, that kind of thing, and oh, I want them to be this kind of education, you're gonna find candidates that look exactly alike that are just like the people that left that job and a lot of times they do tend to be very, you know, either they're, I want to say, you know, yes, maybe they're white guys, but, they're, but, but, but even beyond that, they, they tend to go to the same schools. They tend to have some of the same experiences and have worked at similar places. And, and I've just always believed that you're going to get better creativity when you find people that come from different completely different walks of life, different industries, different. So I, I never cared about where anyone went to school. I literally couldn't care. Um, and so I think once you open up the ability to find candidates that look a little different, and I'd say, you know what, I actually don't want to hire someone for that job that has any liquor experience. I want to bring in somebody that, you know, maybe they've worked in event marketing, or maybe they've done something in PR, or, you know, something related, but, but useful. Yeah then you can find those interesting candidates. Um, and then, you know, it was a lot easier for the HR people. Cause if I, if I was hammering away mm-hmm. at finding me that same candidate, but you know, find me a black woman who's done it, that's hard, you know, cause, cause she hasn't been given the opportunity to do that job before. <laughs> so, yeah, um, absolutely. So- I'm wondering how, did you, do you have any, I'll, I'll leave this point alone. I promise. I know this is my third question to it, but I'm so taken with it. Um, I, do you have any like tricks that you developed even subconsciously in order to help you? I mean, this superpower of, uh, you know, superhero power of building super teams (laughs) is like, everybody wants that. You know, that's the key to success. People build industries just to try to take a taste of it. And so, um, I'm wondering, did you personally ever develop this kind of um, technique or specific thing that you did when you went looking to build these super teams that enabled you to do that, that you can share? You know, I wish I did. I wish I could say, oh, it's just this, you know, do one, you know, one, two, three, and you're, you're there. But I think a lot of it is intuition. And, and part of it is building that muscle of knowing what works. And what I would say is one thing I did that is a very tactical, tangible thing anyone can do. Um, and I've done my pretty much my whole career, but much more aggressively in my later years of my career, I would meet with anywhere between three and five new people that I didn't know a week. And sometimes it would be for a job, but a lot of times it wasn't. It was just, I got introduced to this person from somebody else and they sound interesting and let's grab a coffee. Um, And I think when you do that, you can start to, your brain creates these like, um, neural networks where you can connect the dots and I go, Oh, the thing that person did was so interesting. I would love to have that skill set in, you know, in my team. Can I find somebody who's got some of that? You know what I mean? And you just start to build these bridges and start to, um, become inspired by, by all these different things. But I think, I think a lot of that came from meeting all these different people all the time. And I would meet people outside my industry and I would just meet interesting people. Um, and, you know, I think people started to kind of know, like if they reached out to me on LinkedIn, chances are I'm going to go, sure, I'll meet with you, you know? Um, now it can get a little crazy, obviously, <laughs> you know, yeah, you got to protect your own schedule somewhat, but no, but I think, you know, it's not that hard to carve out a few hours a week 
Um, and, you know, sometimes nothing would come from it, but a lot of times it would either be like, oh, I actually know somebody who could help you in what you're trying to do, or you just inspired me to give me a great idea on something that I'm working on, or, you know, it just, there's a lot of serendipity, but it kind of forces the serendipity, if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. And I like it. And it was, yeah, I think it was a lot trickier to do that back in the day, you know, without social media and things like that. You kind of had to do this um, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon thing, you know, you know, so and so what's going on there. Um, I'm curious, I want to start looking at unpacking Masami and, um, and all of the, the cool things that that company is doing. Is that your sole endeavor at this moment as serving as their CEO? Or do you run any other um, side gigs or consulting firms, anything like that? Yeah, I wish I could say it was my sole endeavor because I love it. It's my baby, but I probably spend about 90% of my time doing that. I still do a little consulting because I had started a brand consulting firm after I left J. Walter Thompson. It's called the HMS Beagle. So we work almost exclusively with startups and helping them get their kind of foundation and narrative and go to market plan. So I still do a little bit of that because I need, like everyone else, you got to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and on Masami, we, um, when I met my partner, so my co-founder, so he and I basically are the co-founders of the brand, um, we decided to do this together, but we decided to self-fund it, you know? Um, so we haven't taken investment money. Um, wow. I mean, my husband is basically our lead investor. I could say that. But um, so, you know, it literally is our baby and every, every uh, dollar we get back, we're putting back into the business. So, so it's little, bootstrapped. Yeah, super bootstrapped. Um, but this is where, you know, I am lucky because I've built a team that um, is pretty committed to the business um, that is all kind of equity based. Mm -hmm. um, so they're all sort of partners in the company and um, I could not do it without them. <laughs> That's yeah. for sure. Let's get into it. I want to know, so you were a co-founder, you were a founder. How many other founders were there um, and when was it launched? So it's just James and I, we're the two founders of the company. James is my partner. He had been working on these hair care formulations for almost 10 years when I met him. Um, he's, he's a bit of a nutty professor in the best way possible. I say that with love. Um, he uh, worked at Clairol for about 20 years and worked on a bunch of other beauty brands. And he was the guy, the Uber producer that would book a lot of the models and would be the one that would get yelled at when he had to color their hair and color it back and it would be fried. Mm -hmm. So um, he just started to feel like there's got to be a product out there that's not going to, you know, that's going to actually hydrate and help their hair <clears throat> and also not have all the toxins that the products on the market have. So he started doing research into formulations and um, our product is really inspired by his husband, Masa, hence the name Masami. Um, Masa is Japanese. He's from Northeast Japan. And um, Masami also means truly beautiful, by the way, in Japanese. So that was another serendipitous moment when we found that out. Yeah. Um, but James would go home with Masa and he was always amazed at how young Masa's family looked and how healthy and, you know, the Japanese have the longest life expectancy in the world. And so um, James started doing some digging into their diet and saw that they were consuming this ocean botanical called Makabu that comes right out of their bay pretty much every day, but they would also grind it up and put it in their skincare and their hair care. And began playing around with that is potentially the answer for hydration, which um, it was. So by the time I met James, um, he had the products about 80, 80, 85% done. <clears throat> and he just didn't know what else to do. He's not a marketer. He's not a brand guy. And um, he, uh, yeah, so we met and he was kind of taking me through everything. I was super skeptical because as someone who's done a lot of marketing, mm -hmm. I usually have a product that's kind of shit and you have to make it sound great. And I'm just, I'm not used to having a product that's absolutely amazing already, you know? Um, and so we did a little more tweaking to the formula to just clean it up a little bit more. We follow EU standards, which are much stricter than the US in terms of uh, what goes in it. The U.S. market, people don't realize, about 90% of the products on the market have toxic stuff in them. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, people don't think as much about the hair care. I think it's a little more, um, there's more awareness in skincare because, you know, it's absorbing into your skin. But the reality is your scalp is actually one of the most absorbent areas of your body. And when you shampoo and you're rubbing it in your head and it's got sulfates and parabens and phthalates, that's not very, that's not very good. So um, part of what we wanted to do is, is create a product without that. But one of the reasons why it's, um, it's so it's so disruptive is that most hair care products that are clean um, as as we are are actually not very good performing products. Right. Yeah. Um, and this in lies the dichotomy. And I've I spoke to you earlier about this, and I have another podcast I'm tempting you on exploring vegan worlds. And it, yes. you know, people hear of vegan, they think of food. And it, there's clothing designers, there's sustainability, environmental impacts, there's all different angles and conversations with the vegan empire. And this is one of the ones that they talk a lot about. Vegan products, you know, people assume a couple of things. One, that it is naturally um, non-toxic, which isn't always true. Hmm. And also there, there tends to be, on the plus side, there tends to be more of a conversation about um, what exactly um, the, the vegan conversation furthers um, responsibility and things like that. You know, there's supposed to be more of a packaging and things like that. And I'm curious how um, I looked at the philosophy and I, I want to kind of climb into um, the Institute and the studies about getting back into the environmental impact with um, Masami. Um, can you kind of speak to, is it James who ha kind of led this um, research part Institute to the, the product? It was actually James's husband, Masa. Um, so when we launched the brand, one of the things that was really important to us is to have a mission and a purpose and not just sell product. And we just are very big believers that when you take from the earth, you have to give back. It's just as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And so um, the area in Northeast Japan where we get our makabu and we get it from a local family owned uh, seaweed company, we've actually gone and visited them and saw their facility and really were very impressed with how they manage everything. Um, uh, anyway, where we, where we get that, we, um, they were devastated by the tsunami back in 2011. Um, that still has not, uh, they, feel, they haven't fully recovered from, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, so we were, uh, again, serendipity, uh, fortunate to find a guy named Kazuyu Yoshino who moved from Tokyo, he was an IT director, and when the tsunami hit, he felt this calling to move up to Atsushi, this little tiny town, and it, it was basically flattened. The town was pretty much flattened. Um, and he decided to go up there and help, and his way of helping is he dives into the bay and he documents what's going on there with the um, growth, with um, the ocean botanicals, um, and he was, the the one that figured out, um, probably now it would have been about two or three years ago, that there was a huge sea urchin problem. The sea urchins had been washed into the bay and mm -hmm. were multiplying and were basically eating all of the stuff that the people there relied on and had thrown the ecosystem completely out of balance. So anyway, um, we decided to form the Masami Institute where we can donate part of our um, sales um, to help his research so that he's just got uh, you know more resources to continue to do what he's been doing. And a lot of it is educating people. So the way he solved the sea urchins problem is he had people eat the sea urchins. <laughs> so, you know, we're the top of the food chain and it was like, well, wait a minute, you know, they're eating all of our good stuff. We should just eat them. And so he created a magazine and had all these sea urchin recipes because um, apparently um, in that region, people would eat sea urchins like on Christmas Day. It was like a delicacy, you know, it wasn't something they did all the time. And um, he really uh, helped change that and get the, basically get the, that whole bay back on track. Um, so that's been really interesting. So, you know, in a perfect world, we'd like to not just fund his research, but, but also move beyond that little tiny area of Japan that we're focused on. Um, but, um, one thing at a time, you know, yeah. our, our feeling was let's start where we can make an impact and then we'll move out from there. Cool. Can you speak to, given, you know, your, your advertising and, and marketing, um, career prior to coming on with Misami, I'm wondering, um, 
how have you kind of sculpted, it's got this beautiful narrative, you know, that you've just kind of walked over with us with the environment and sustainability. And if you take, you give back. And how has that played into the rhetoric that you try to communicate with marketing or packaging or any of those endeavors that you've looked at? Have you allowed that, that dialogue to carry through or pushed it through? I think there's a place for where you tell that story and then there's a place where people just want to know, does it work? You know? Yeah. Like, is it going to actually work? Does it hydrate my hair and all that stuff? So, you know, beauty's funny that way. Um, I think that's why a lot of beauty brands have gotten away without having to have any purpose or give back because people are just, you know, want to just know that it's going to perform. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so I think as we've developed our content strategy and narrative, we've figured out when and where, you know, it was World Ocean Day um, uh, on yesterday, on the 8th. Um, so that's a great place where we could kind of reinforce that message. And, you know, we try to do that um, regularly. I mean, my biggest challenge on us being a pro-ocean brand is our plastic. Because we're in plastic bottles, you know, the the, the the hard part about being in hair care is that you're in the shower. So you have a limited number mm -hmm. of materials that you can work with. And glass is usually the go-to for beauty brands, right? You can't really be in glass bottles um, in yeah. the shower. So we are actually creating a large size refillable, sustainable bottle that's beautiful, that will go in the shower, um, that you can refill with cardboard uh, packages. Um, and I'm excited about that because I feel like that will help us yeah. mitigate yeah. Our, our, our plastic issue. I've come to that myself. Um, I dabble in, it depends on my ambition for the month, but I dabble in making, I make all of our own um, hand soaps and I've dabbled mm -hmm. in shampoos and conditioners. They don't work well, so I kind of quit. But I did get into the idea that I didn't want to keep filling plastic containers, even reusing plastic, regardless of how safe, doesn't rub me overly well and i came into um this the glass thing exactly that you know and and um a lot of metals rust like there isn't a great solution there so i really like the idea of this one i think it's groundbreaking i hope it is i mean we ended up because of exactly what you're saying we looked at all different kinds of materials and you know there's bamboo material but mm. it gets moldy there's there's just different issues and so we ended up doing a ceramic bottle, which people say to me, yeah, but it can still break. I'm like, I know, but it's not going to have little shards of pain that you're going to yeah. step on. It's going to break into chunks that you can just pick up and throw out and we'll send you a new one. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a great um, idea. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it sticks. Um, I've had a fair amount of interest so far for pre-order, um, but we're going to try to get that thing made and out in the next, I, I hope, four or five months. It's hard to say with COVID going on because mm -hmm. timelines for a supply chain are all kind of out of whack right now. But anyway. Supply chain is out of whack. However, I wonder, has interest peaked? You know, health has had the vegan community for any reason, vegan by default, vegan because of a mantra, has peaked, you know, over the past three months. Naturally, when you have a pandemic breaking out, it makes everyone kind of re-question their own personal health all the way down to, you know, I think a lot of people started with food and things like that with just the natural dialogue and then very quickly got into, you know, I myself took, and I've, I've, I, I fancy myself incredibly healthy and have had like new analysis, you know, and lenses applied to areas that I hadn't thought about before, nail polish, you know, yeah. things that I should have been thinking about. But um, I imagine it has spiked for you. Have you guys been able to kind of um, at least have some chartable measure as to interest since the pandemic has taken hold? I mean, yes, but the tricky thing for us is we launched in February. Ah. So, you know, it's sort of like we don't really have a benchmark because we launched at New York Fashion Week okay. a couple weeks right before everything was shut down. Um, and we had a, you know, in March, it was very up and down. There were weeks where it was crickets and I was like, oh, shit, you know, <laughs> but then but then business would pick up again. And I, I do think what you're saying is true, though, the conversations um, and searching for solutions that are less toxic, that are clean beauty, that are blue beauty, I think are all happening right now. And obviously we are a brand that fits all that. Um, but on top of that, we actually work. So to me, that's like our holy grail is, you know, yeah, that's the thing with, yeah. at least with shampoo and uh, mind you, I'm not a mixologist and I don't pretend to be a chemist, but um, it's kind of an issue. Yeah. For anyone that's tried to go um, that route due to 
toxins or any other thing. You know, I flip over um, free trade, great like sounding shampoos and the ingredient list is like 90,000. And um, I'm a, you know, master's educated woman and I don't know what half of them are. Like, it's yeah. just, it's, um, it's lunacy to think that it's still out there like that and not being vilified. So yours working is um, clean enough, you know, like that's amazing being vegan, it working, like having all of these things, the new ceramic thing. It sounds, it sounds amazing. Have you guys projected, I know it's, this is like asking someone about another child when you're in labor, people are like, how could you ask that? But um, <laughs> right now, because, you know, COVID has just thrown everyone through a, a, an incredible whirlwind, but have you kind of looked at your next one to three year projections as to where you guys would like to be even considering the pandemic and the change that that's happened? And if so, where do you, where do you see your sites for your goals for the future? Yeah. I mean, I think um, we're pretty good about doing the rigorous, you know, business metrics. So we've yeah. got five year projections. Um, I think part of it for us is expanding our footprint, um, really developing some salon partnerships here in the U S but also launching some more products. Um, we're, we're very much into the Japanese simplicity headspace, meaning we're not gonna launch another shampoo. We're not gonna be a brand that has five variants of shampoo. Nice. Our yeah. one variant works for virtually everyone. And when, it, when you get the hydration, you get shine, you get manageability, you get volume. It works for color treated hair. Like you don't need another <laughs> version of our shampoo. But we are gonna launch things like a hair mask, you know, a beard balm because our products are gender neutral. So I really want to lean into that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so we've got some stuff in the pipeline there. So I would love to get those out. We were going to try to get them out this year again, but I don't think that's going to happen now. So next year, but, um, and then we'd love to, to, uh, to go international, you know, um, I think um, right now, you know, the priority is to really nail the U S yeah. uh, but great. I, I think our products, we tested on every ethnicity, every hair type, you know, multiple types of Asian hair. And we just got such great response across the board um, that I do think the audience is much wider um, than just here. And it is gender neutral. So we actually, I'm, I'm surprised. We, the orders we got today were all men. For yeah. whatever reason, like we actually have about 40% of our sales are men. Good. They need so, it. Yeah. I think that men's products smell. I think they're disgusting. They remind me of something that we should have left behind with the 30s. You know? Yes. <laughs> like a lime in it or something. It just terrifies me. It's always so daunting. Why does it always have to smell like Dracar from the 80s or something? It's just this awful smell too. Um, but sure. shampoos that have been marketed to men should be taken out and given a strong lecture to, mm -hmm. in my opinion, in my humble yes, opinion. I would agree with you. Um, I'm wondering, uh, given everything that you're doing well first of all can can people purchase it can we can they hit Absolutely. your website can they pre-order okay well, so well, in well our full line is is for sale the ceramic bottle right now is on iFund women but we're about to we're going to slide that over to our site for pre-purchase um but yeah everything is for sale and um, we're also on amazon yeah excellent yeah. Um, and a final question before I wrap up and ask you my final, final question, which is um, on your site, yeah. I wouldn't be answering to my in, um, community if I didn't say, you know, I hit your website. I do a lot of research for these, um, these chats I have. Um, and I, I, I always pull up those pictures. I like our team, our story, who are you? Yeah. Give me, give me. And I did notice, and I told you before we started, I said, why are you the only woman with like four men on there? And that's rhetorical. You know, this, this is how it happens in a lot of industries, but you had some interesting news. So can you kind of speak to, um, your executive staff and what your team looks like right now? Yeah, um, that has not been updated. As I said to you, I was literally just having that conversation with myself this morning thinking, oh my God, you know, we don't have the right uh, outward uh, reality of our team. So yeah, I have three other, um, three other people that need to be on there that, that are all women um, nice. that, are, that are really core, 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 core to the team. One heads up our digital marketing, one heads up our content strategy, and one heads up our PR. Um, so I am going to be updating that to reflect the, 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 the full team, um, which I'm excited about. Um, and we work with, you know, when I hire, um, 
editors and photographers and things like that, we're always trying to look for, again, diverse, diverse people. We, um, we do try to make a point of, of casting a wide net and finding, finding those people to kind of help us when we need help whether that's, you know, I've got um, two different uh, women who are people of color. One's a designer who's helped us quite a bit, actually. Nice. And another one's an editor who did our brand video for us. So I don't put those people on our website, but that's just part of, again, you know, the, the magic of, of uh, finding, finding those talent. Yeah. And your legacy, it sounds like mm -hmm. from your, you know, entire career history of what you did in the past. Um, I must say from a bird's eye point of view of looking in and being married to an original Silicon Valley computer nerd and having looked at that industry for the past 20 years from the outside, a safe um, judging distance is what I like to say, overly mm -hmm. judgmental right here. And I do love your site. So they did amazing work. You know, Thank these you. women, I think it's, it's, it speaks the aesthetic of um, a, a, a stereotypical aesthetic of like a Japanese, you know, the, the simplicity mm -hmm. and, and all of that, which actually sounds like is a lot of the narrative throughout what you're doing. You're not launching, you know, five different shampoos. You've got this one, like that yeah. clarity. Um, from an art historical point of view, which is what I have my master degree in, um, that seems very true as well. So it's, it's comforting. It's very interesting to kind of receive that um, wash over as well. So we're at the final point, um, my question, my favorite question. They're all my favorites, but if I had to pick one, this would be her. Um, I'm wondering if you walked up to someone in a so safe social distance tomorrow, or they walked up to yeah. you rather, and it was a woman or a female identified or non-binary individual, pretty much um, anyone but a straight cisgendered white man. Um, and they said to you, hey, Lynn, you know, I'm so glad to have run into you. I've, I have this amazing thing I'm doing. I've this 20 year career uh, climbing up the ranks and the ladders and the ad agency, you know, in the epicenter of that world. And I've just left it. Um, I'm, I'm endeavoring on this new startup and um, I'm so excited. What are the top three pieces of advice you would give that individual knowing what you know now? Yeah, I would say um, build a network find a support system for yourself. Um, you know, that's been really helpful. I'm a, I'm part of several female founder groups and, you know, just having other women to talk to about the journey, the stress, sometimes what happens in your personal life, my teenagers, you know, all that stuff is, is, yeah. is very helpful. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing is build your team, which we talked about earlier, but I think um, the piece around that, that I would just reinforce to people that are looking to start a business is um, it's obvious that you need help, but a lot of people, a lot of women, I shouldn't say a lot of people, a lot of women think that they need to figure everything out themselves first mm -hmm. and then bring in the help. And I would just um, challenge that and say, um, understand what you love to do and what you don't love to do. And if, it's, if there's stuff that you don't love to do, don't feel like you need to get it and understand it and master it, find somebody else to do it. <laughs> yeah. And just like, don't be afraid to acknowledge that, you know what, I don't love spreadsheets and numbers and I'm going to just bring in somebody and they're going to manage that. Like, that's not a weakness. That's actually really good because you can focus on the things that, that you're really good at. And then the third thing I would say is find a mentor, um, which is a little different than, than, you know, you're just getting your network. Find, find a, several mentors, not just one. Um, and don't wait till one's presented to you, you know, like go out and find people that you think, you know, will help you, will inspire you, that you can learn from, that have done something that you want to do. And um, I've had people reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, hey, would you mentor me? I just need an hour a month. And I'm like, yes, of course. Um, and that's, that's, it's rewarding for me. It's rewarding for them. Um, and you'll be surprised how generous people can be, I think. Absolutely. I love those. I will say that in 200 episodes plus doing this, you're the first person to talk and your advice, uh, your three advice about your team, about building the team. And mm -hmm. I love that because I think it's everything for success. Very few people are just this solopreneur, you know, their ideas and how quickly we grow. And also you are in company with well over 90% of women who say, um, 
women don't outsource enough. This whole got to do it all. And a lot of people have argued that it's built, baked into, you know, the stereo gender roles that we're given in this society where you got to be wife, mother, you know, entrepreneur, like all of these things, you're just expected to do all these things. Whereas the, the stereotypically the male gender has been very, very good about outsourcing, you know, about very, very happy to get a housekeeper, you know, when they don't feel like they clean their house adequately. And um, women assign value to being able to do it themselves in areas that actually deplete businesses. And I would argue even their own livelihoods and happiness and their personal lives. Yeah. But, so I have number one, build a network um, and a support system. Number two, my favorite, build your team. Um, you do not need to know everything and uh, do everything before you hire out for it. Rather, focus in on what you're good at and what brings you um, the most success and happiness. And number three, find several mentors and don't wait for one to be presented to you. And you I love those. They're very actionable items too. It's all very like get to work, get going. Like I love that. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us, Lynn. We're out of time today, but I really appreciate your thank candor you. and your advice and um, you sharing a little bit of uh, your wonderful history and um, your current endeavors with Masami. I love it. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. And for everyone listening, we've been speaking with Lynn Power. You can find out more about Masami, her company on www.lovemasami.com. I myself am going to be jumping on and grabbing some for certain. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for giving me your time today. And until we speak again next time, remember to always bet on yourself. Sancho. Cool.